Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We do have a few announcements this morning. Uh, Handbell Choir rehearsal will happen again today. Uh, <laughs> I like saying it because Devin reacts so well. <laughs> Um, so if you are still a little curious and you're like, oh, I've heard, I've heard them talk about this for a few weeks now, and mm, Debbie would be happy to have you in the handout choir. <laughs> They're playing in Advent. So the plan is December 17th, so yeah. <laughs> even if you don't play, you'll want to be in worship that day. Mark your calendars, because um, I think that will be a, a good day. A good day. Owen, Owen set up the bells for you today. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Owen. <laughs> It's a team effort. We need everybody. Um, so this week, the, the office will be open. Uh, Tahisha will be available for you on Monday and Tuesday. Otherwise, the office will be closed uh, the rest of the week. So if you need something, Monday and Tuesday are the days to do that. Um, next Sunday, we have a couple of things happening uh, in worship. Uh, United Methodist Student Day is one of the six special Sundays of the United Methodist Church. Uh, the money raised uh, from that Sunday goes for scholarships, and I think we have a video talking about that. Maybe. <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> it worked first service. The morning service guy got it. <laughs>
also for Advent, we need people to help light the uh, Advent candles for each Sunday of worship as well as Christmas Eve. So uh, check your schedule. Uh, we need two people at each service because that makes things a little easier. And um, But you, it's not like you have to be in the same family. If uh, maybe your spouse doesn't want to, but you do, find a friend. <laughs> It doesn't have to be whatever, you know, magic, like, it, it is who it is, and we're grateful for assistance. So, um, if you want to, find, find someone to, to do that with you. Uh, also out there on the tables um, are the uh, this week's uh, silent auctions for the preschool. Uh, they'll be putting out a few items each week, and then they'll be out for a couple of weeks, and then uh, there'll be new items coming. So, if what you see here maybe doesn't trip your trigger, but um, there will be things in another couple of weeks. But there are some good things out there that might make really excellent gifts. <laughs> so this might be a great way to, to snag some of those things. So um, additionally, uh, the Kids Above All gifts are due today. So if you hear, are hearing me that say this and went, <gasps> I left it at home. <laughs> Just talk to Judy and she will be glad to make uh, arrangements to get those uh, from you, uh, hopefully uh, later today. Um, I think that I will encourage you to continue to read all of the announcements. We are still in need of cookie bakers for the cookie walk, so there's lots of stuff happening and we are grateful uh, for the ways that all of you contribute to all the things. Carol, will you help lead us to <clears throat> Please join me in the mission statement. The mission statement of the United Methodist Church of Antioch is to grow in faith, to worship God, and to love the Lord Jesus Christ. The mission statement of the United Methodist Church of Antioch is to grow in faith, to worship God, following the teachings of Jesus Christ, and to be instruments of God's love through the Holy Spirit as we reach out to our community and the world. We are welcome to worship. When we gather for worship, we try to set aside the things that pull our attention outside these walls. 
Can you see what's interesting about this picture? No. There's two bald eagles in this picture. See them both? So that's my parents' backyard. Um, I have permission to use all of these pictures because I took them. So. <laughs> No, no Google permission <laughs> issues for me. So as you look at these pictures, what do they have in common? Anything? Outdoors. They're all outside. Okay. Anything else? They're nature. God's world. God's, God's world. Okay. What's different about them? Will you cycle back through for me, Mike? What's different about them? Different seasons. So this one might be summer, spring, and this one summer, fallish. Kind of. This is probably sunrise, and so it's a little darker, right? because I was at the Grand Canyon in July one year. <laughs> That's a fun time. Um, so summery, and then we had the winter one, right? Uh, that was solidly winter. <laughs> <laughs> so in that, in this God's world, in these pictures of nature, things don't always stay the same, do they? Like, like we know that spring moves into summer, moves into fall, and we're kind of in that weird dancing between fall and not quite winter, but not quite fall either. We're, we're, we're doing this back and forth thing, aren't we? Um, so is any one of these pictures straight up ugly? No. We have different views, different things, different parts of God's creation, but we can say that they're all beautiful too, can't we? So when we see that God has made us something so beautiful, what should we do in response? Praise. There we go. See, um, he's just working with people things. They're giving you good stuff. So we praise God. We say thank you. We say, wow. You know, we can kind of sit in awe for a minute and go, whew, how does that happen, right? And that's what our scripture lesson today is all about is praising God for what we have and noticing God everywhere, including gathering for worship. Like, this is part of what we do as thank you to God. Make sense? Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, you have given us means to get to know you. You have given us your scriptures. You have given us this time, times like this where we can pray and we can talk to you and we can take all that's on our hearts to you. We thank you for, for these regular ways of coming to know who you, are, who you are. We thank you for putting us in awe of the beauty that you have created around us, whether that's amazing things like the Grand Canyon or whether that's just flowers in our backyard. Help us to see you in the big things as well as in the little things because you have created all the earth and even us on the earth to love you and to be in relationship with one another. One another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So our next hymn this morning is probably one that 
most of us are unfamiliar with. Um, so it's number 501 in the hymnal. Um, just a couple words about it. It, it speaks to the all-consuming nature of our faith and how God loves us and how we love God in return. So it works really well with this idea that worship shapes who we are. But it's also a double Wesley hymn in that the words are written by Charles Wesley, and the uh, hymn tune is written by his son, Samuel Sebastian Wesley, who was named after his father, Samuel, so that's why we have to designate the difference there. Uh, so this is a father and son combo that brought us this hymn this morning. Um, and since we've been talking about the Wesleys and, and been steeping ourselves in Wesley things, uh, this hymn made perfect sense for this one. So if you get lost in it, because there are a couple places where it might not go exactly where you expect it to. If you get lost in that way, just I invite you and encourage you to think about the words and think about the message of the hymn. And you may already see it this week. <laughs> Thank you. 
salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all peoples. For, the great, for great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods, for all the gods of, all, of the people are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord in glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice and let them say among the nations, the Lord is king. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Say also, save us, God, of our salvation, and gather and rescue us from among the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray? <coughs> Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be precious in your hearing this day. Amen. When John and Charles Wesley were igniting this revitalization in England, they were working at a time when there wasn't a whole lot of that spark happening in a lot of places. Paul Chilcote says about that age this, in an age when both preaching and sacrament were at low ebb in the life of the church, the Wesleyan emphasis on pulpit and table was like a two-edged sword. This conjunction was a potent agent in the spread of the revival. So they were highlighting the fact that worship to be its most animating had to include both good preaching and nourishing <coughs> sacraments. We, we understand the need for good worship, don't we? Right? We, we might not be able to describe it well or explain it, but, but we know we want good preaching in the pulpit, right? We know we want communion to be meaningful for us. We, so it's this piece of, like, we know what the expectation is, but it's hard to, like, when the DS asks you, so what do you want in your next pastor? You're like, uh, <coughs> somebody good? <laughs> because trying to say we want someone who will explain the context of the scriptures to us. We want somebody who will explain why it matters to our world today. We want somebody who cares for us. Like all of these things feel like it's hard to say in that moment. Like we just, send us somebody good, right? But we all have a level of known expectation, right? Because there's been a lot of talk lately with the, the clock and the time change, I've heard the story a number of times, but it's been like, oh, I forget who the pastor was, but do you remember when we hung the clock in the eyesight of the pastor, because whoever it was, and it could have been any of us, right? Whoever it was, apparently went over the time expectation. And so the church said, this is how we'll let the pastor know, because we know what the expectation is. And apparently we were, whoever it was, was just not following along, right? So we know... We understand this idea that, that worship has to give us something needy, that it can't just be fluff, right? Now up to this point, as we've talked about Wesleyan renewal, we've looked at the living word, the, the Bible, we need to, to discover that again for our lives, saving faith about how it's not our own faith that save us, saves us, but in fact it's the faith of Jesus that saves us. We've talked about accountable discipleship, how we need each other to keep us accountable, to keep us honest, to keep us encouraged in the life of this faith. We can't do this without each other. And today we're talking about formative worship. 
So as we think about this whole, whole string of topics, right, we're really beginning to get a clear picture that the Wesleys were really serious about wanting a whole life change because we know and love Jesus. They really, they lived out and expected that if you came to believe and be changed because of Jesus, that things in your life would fall into place because of that. And that would shift things that might have been in a different priority order previously. Now, Lester Roos tells a story about how crucial this whole life re revolution was, uh, especially to John. He writes, early in John Wesley's ministry, a new teaching that he learned about troubled him. According to this teaching, people were to wait for grace by doing only that. You weren't just supposed to wait for grace. You weren't supposed to go to church. You weren't supposed to pray about it. You weren't supposed to read scripture. You were just supposed to wait for grace. Now, Wesley was troubled by this teaching because it contradicted what had always been a part of Methodist spirituality, this methodical attendance to the ordinances of God, such as prayer, such as participation in Holy Communion, such as reading scriptures, searching the scriptures, as he would say. So Wesley rejected outright rejected this teaching that it isn't about waiting for grace to appear, but about being actively involved in finding God where God has always been. So these gospel ordinances are means of God, means ordained of God as the usual channels of grace. So they are outward signs, they are words, they are actions ordained of God and appointed for this end to be the ordinary, the usual, the regular places for God to convey grace to humanity. So people should use these means not only because their use is commanded, but because normally, through their use, God can be met. Like, these are the ways that we know work. <laughs> when we feel like things are a bit off, though, right? Sometimes we get into that space where We've been doing these things, and then we're just kind of, mm, stuff doesn't feel like it used to. It isn't, hmm, eh. There are these times when it becomes hard to pray. It's hard to get dressed and leave for worship in the morning. Wesley, Wesley would advise us to just keep doing these things. He wouldn't say, wait for grace to appear again, but continue to pray. Continue to search the scriptures. Continue to attend worship with the people in your community who surround you and who can walk with you in this time. Right? Don't neglect the habits that God made us fall. Right? Because doubts and questions come. Right? We come to the table sometimes and we're like, why am I doing this? What does this even mean? What is this about? We open the scriptures and sometimes it doesn't feel like the living word, but like a dead doorstop, right? And the Wesleys would say, just keep at it. And we have people who have lived through these dark seasons. We have Mother Teresa, and actually John Wesley himself lived through a dark season. And it's about staying with these habits that got you this far. Now, we often also hear... I don't need to go to church to know Jesus. Right? I, I'm good. Right? I can appreciate God's creation. We saw beautiful pictures of God's I don't, I don't have to be in a building to do that, right? I'm good in my deer stand. I'm good in my fishing boat. I'm good on my hiking trail. I don't, I don't have to be here. Right? Lester Ruth reminds us of the ways that the Wesleys would respond to that kind of thinking. He writes, although the Wesleys admitted that God can offer grace apart from the means that were ordained, that were set as a way to come to know God, they wanted to know why people thought God ordinarily would. If we have these usual means where God, sh God shows up, why would we go someplace else and expect something different? When we know that these historically have worked, we know that God shows up in prayer, we know that God shows up in reading scripture, we know that, that God shows up when we worship. Why would we 
intentionally go someplace else, when we have these immediately before us, the what's and the what else. So we continue to use these practices, these ancient practices that have proven historically true. We know that God shows up in prayer because God has shown up in prayer for ages because people have testified to us. They've told us their experiences, right? So we trust that God will show up again, even if it takes a while, even if we have to do it, even when it doesn't feel, when our feelings aren't like, mm, not so much into this, God comes back to us. Because it's not really about how we feel anyway, right? God is faithful no matter what we feel like. <laughs> if we have a day where we're not mm, so into it, God still loves us. God still cares for us, and God still holds us. So if we think about how coming to worship, being here, shapes who we are, forms who we are, it's, it's the preaching, it's the sacrament, it's the singing of our hymns, right? These shared practices help us to learn grace and mercy and forgiveness and hope and love and the promises of God, right? This notion that we learn as much of our theology through our hymnal as we do through preaching and teaching is true, right? Because we learn the hymn tunes and those settle in in new ways, and then we sing the hymns, and then lo and behold, that we get we get to a new hymn and it has we know the tune, but there's new words, and we learn a new piece of theology that way, and it settles in differently than it does even from this kind of, of interaction, right? Most of us have at least one song from our teenage years that the minute we hear on the radio the first opening, the opening notes of it, we all know how it would go. We haven't thought about the song in decades, probably, but we've met, like, somehow we start singing and the words come out of our mouth in the right order. Right? So we know music seeps in deeper. It stays with us, right? When I go visit people who, whose dementia is severe, there are things that they know, right? They know Jesus loves me. They can sing that in a, you know, like, they just know it. They know the Lord's Prayer because they've been doing these things their whole lives. But, the, but hymns, hymns stick. And that's why we keep singing them. That's why we sing good theology. That's why we cling to them. Because then, when we need them, in those moments that feel off, we can go to those hymns. Even if it's the simple hymn, Jesus loves me, right? If we are feeling off one day, and we just sing through our heads, Jesus loves me, this I know. That's a great place to start if you're feeling off in that relationship with God. Sing that truth to yourself. Know it. Right? This is, this is part of who we are. This is why, why the hymns we sing matter. This is why we're so grateful for an excellent music department in this church. Because we have quality music to sing to. We hear uh, anthems and special music all summer with good quality musicians, but also with good words. And we, we leave here going, oh yeah. How many, how many times have any of us, right, Debbie's playing a prelude or postlude, and we start singing along. Because we know it. And all of this worship shapes who we are. It forms us into being good, faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Not because of anything we've done, but because we know the love of Jesus Christ. So when all of these things come together in worship, the preaching, the sacraments, the song, the music, right? We find ourselves experiencing Jesus with all of who we are, right? Sometimes we catch ourselves moving our bodies to the music, you know, if there's a good prelude. Like sometimes the offering, this happens a lot with the offertory that I see kind of people kind of <laughs> dare to bop. <laughs> dare I say, you know, in our good Midwestern, we don't move. <laughs> Shelby would like to argue that we all should move more, but <laughs> we were able to ponder the scripture reading, we're able to ponder the sermon in a different way, right? We're able to verbalize our need for forgiveness, our understanding of grace, partly because we've sung the words in these hymns. And 
we're going through life doing our thing, and then we hit one, and we're like, oh my gosh, how did they write a hymn that I needed today in 1739 or whatever? You know, like, this happens, and we find ourselves in the storm. Friends, this kind of all-encompassing formative worship shapes who we are. It makes us into better disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen.
I want us to be able to touch all of them. So if you are in a place where you can move to make sure that some of these quilts that maybe aren't currently reachable could be reached, that would be great at this time. So feel free to, and we're gonna bless them here in a minute, so I wanna make sure we get them all blessed.
May people know that they are loved by you no matter what. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us take all of our concerns. God, we celebrate all that worship does for us and how it communicates our love for you to you. We know that you are the ultimate audience for worship, but we're grateful that we can eavesdrop along the way. We learn so much from hearing your scriptures read aloud, from sharing our joys and concerns, from praying together, from singing together, from hearing special music, from sharing in the sacraments as we have the opportunity. We find ways into deepening our relationships with you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for creating this opportunity to spend time with you. We know that this week our country will set aside a day to mark our gratitude. We ask that you would help us to share from our bounty, raise awareness of those around us who need help, share our gratitude with whomever we find ourselves this week, be it biological family or chosen family. We pray that we would be people who live out our thankfulness without waiting for a special day. For those whose names we have shared today who are in need of your care, we ask for special attention. We know that we aren't necessarily going to get the outcome we would choose, but we pray for your presence in the midst, for your grace and mercy to rule, and for love to clear a path where there wasn't one before. Of all the things we're grateful for, we add to the list the blessings in our lives that we know come from you. Thank you for a community in which we can share good news and the gladness that multiplies. Thank you for the shared laughter and smiles that help us remember that we are in all the things together and we are in all the things with you. We thank you, Lord, for the ways that we know how we can worship you and that we can Thank you for teaching us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, then, I invite our usher forward to receive this morning's tithes and offerings, our generous response to a God who has been abundantly generous with us, and also feel free to return to whatever seat you are more comfortable with. <laughs>
together dedicate our gifts to God. Jesus, you are a red cornerstone. You are the foundation on which everything in our lives is built. Hold us in your arms that we might know your peace. As we offer to you today gifts that are in fact already yours, may your will be done with them. May they be the help that someone needs, the food on someone's table, and the hope of your kingdom may be known in the world. In your name. Be with all of you. And also with you. 